in the midst of the Cold War, here the Soviet Union and the United States poised to annihilate each other with, with nuclear weapons, and it was an extraordinary time. Of course, we were all given orders, which were supposed to be secret, to come to Washington and to not discuss the reason for those orders with anyone, even our wives. When NASA finally got interested in sending somebody into space, it was such a new thing. It was all very, very secret at that time. We went through a long selection process, and which included physical and psychological and all every measurement they knew how to make on the human body, I guess. So when we finally came down and we were finally selected, we were very happy to be there and felt honored to be among the seven to be selected. Well, I realized that I had been chosen to be part of the first team. That was the end-all, be-all for me. The original seven were, of course, figures that were revered. The engineers who were doing the designs, the launch crews who were doing the day-in and day-out work, and then the crew shimmying in into those little tin cans called capsules that were taking us into the heavens. The mission was planned to come back and land on the water. And so we did a lot of water training on it too. So what would happen if you had a leak in the spacecraft after you once hit the water? Uh, what the impact would be? Uh, uh, if you're underwater, could you get out? And training like that, that tried to train for every possible contingency. When I got to fly the shuttle, I knew what to expect. I think when John flew his first flight, he didn't know what to expect. And that's a huge difference. <laughs> when John first launched, uh, he was on a brand new rocket. Uh, never been to orbit before. Uh, we didn't know uh, how humans would react in zero G. We didn't know whether they'd be able to eat. Uh, some people said their eyes wouldn't focus. All kinds of crazy stories that John told me that they told him before he launched to expect. He didn't believe any of those and most of them were not true, but we just didn't know back then. The day that I finally went, that was my, that was the third time I had actually suited up and been on top and been locked in and ready to go. But when you finally get in the thing and you're ready to go, uh, you're very, very busy. People think you're in there contemplating great thoughts, and I think it, it's more likely you're in there, as I was, double-checking all the instrumentation and talking to the people on the ground crew uh, to make sure that uh, everything was okay for launch. That countdown for the launch is something you've done time and time and time again, so it was, in a sense, just another day at the office, but this was real and it caught everybody's attention. Godspeed, John Glenn. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Roger, the clock is operating. We're underway. Hey, loud and clear. Roger, we're programming and roll okay. Godspeed. John Glenn. I was in the blockhouse when he was, and the last to speak to him before liftoff. Gus and Al had both done that, but they weren't riding on this big, big fuel tank that had enough, had the ability to give him more speed than what Al and Gus had had. They didn't have enough to coast all the way around the world. They just had enough to go up a little ways and fall back to Earth. People look at all this fire and smoke on the ground, they think you're under huge stress inside. You're not. Uh, the thrust is just barely greater than the weight of the spacecraft, so you lift off very gently. And the more the fuel burns out there, the lighter it becomes, and the thrust is still high. So the farther you go up here on this entry into space, the more the more G's you feel inside. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. Oh, that view is tremendous. Roger, turn around, I've started. Roger, capsule turning around, and I could see the booster during turnaround just a couple of hundred yards behind me. It was beautiful. 
Everything worked perfectly, and then there was an indication that John's heat shield was loose, which meant that after the third orbit and on the deorbit, uh, that he would burn up if it was. Well, I certainly wanted to make it a two-way trip and come back, of course. It's the first thing I actually remember in my whole life, is sitting in front of our nice black and white TV on the floor, because I had to get real close because, you know, I was really excited about this, watching the John Glenn flight. And the thing I remember most about it is sitting there worrying about whether or not John Glenn was going to survive when that heat shield was you know, getting loose. During re-entry then, instead of jettisoning that retro pack here uh, and getting it off so I had a clean heat shield for re-entry, we left that on so that the heat shield would be held in place until the aerodynamic force of re-entry uh, would tend to hold the heat shield in place. Now that made for an, an interesting, well the, the re-entry was going to be interesting anyway, but it was even more interesting because as I would glance occasionally out the little window, I could see chunks of that retro pack breaking up and coming back by the window. My condition is good, but that was a real fireball, boy. I had great chunks of that retro pack breaking off all the way through. Rocking quite a bit. I may still have some of that pack on. I can't damp it either. And I couldn't be absolutely certain then whether it was the uh, heat shield breaking up or the retro pack. And uh, obviously it was a retro packer, wouldn't be here today. But anyway, it was a, that kind of re-entry was the second problem we had in addition to the uh, control system failure. If you listen to the tapes, it's pretty clear that he knows that there's something going on there and it's not the normal procedure because he knew the procedures really well. He knew that retro pack should have been gone. Uh, coming out of the blackout period and saying, Houston, this is Friendship 7. And of course the nation went nuts. The world went nuts. Main chute is on green. Chute is out in reef condition at 10,800 feet and beautiful chute. Chute looks good. On O2 emergency and the chute looks very good. The, his odds of, of, uh, of not surviving this was about one in six. So it was an extremely high risk, unknown effort that they were going into having never done it before. And it came time for, for um, aligning the capsule in the proper attitude for retrofire. There was under thrust of the rockets themselves, and the result of the, uh, the intermittently uh, failed horizon scanner meant that the, that, uh, the rockets were pointed in the wrong direction. Each one of those failures uh, made me fly a little bit too far, and it all added up to 250 miles. Had a lot of people uh, frightened. I was not frightened by that because, contrary to their lack of knowledge about my location, I knew exactly where I was. I was back on the water where I wanted to be. We did research. We learned the new things first. And those were, and with a little investment and educated citizenry, away we went with a, a uh, we were, became a leader in the world in just about a century and a quarter. It was a total resounding success. And uh, it was a great, great honor and pleasure to be a part of such a marvelous and successful program.